Welcome to Eritrea channel and nafasi.com. Today we are here with uh, Jamal Countess, a photojournalist with uh, over 30 years experience. He's been at it for a long time and um, we are glad to have him. He was in Eritrea. He spent a great deal of time in Ethiopia uh, working uh, as a photojournalist uh, chronicling the developments that were taking place in uh, Maikadra and other places. Uh, we will talk about that and more. But first, um, Mr. Countess, uh, thank you for taking the time to come here uh, while under a tremendous amount of uh, busy schedule and uh, a lot of things happening. So I do appreciate that very much. And uh, could you please uh, introduce yourself? Let us know uh, who you are, how you got started in the photojournalism uh, business and what your influences are. I think that'd be a great way to start. All right. Well, yeah, my name is Jamal Countess. I, I am a native of the in Baltimore, Maryland. And, um, so back in the 70s, uh, when my father was um, a few years out of the Air Force after uh, a few tours in Korea and Vietnam, he taught us all how to develop and print black and white, for t you know, film and uh, prints. So at the age of nine, I and my other siblings, we basically learned how to process and print film. And, you know, that was kind of the beginning of, of my journey. And it was also during that time that I'm looking at, um, you know, National Geographic and Life magazine and Time magazine and looking at stories from uh, and photo work from Larry Burroughs and um, Sebastio Salgado and other famous photographers who had either been covering Vietnam or covering just life in general from, let's say, the 60s on forward to like the, um, the 70s and early 80s. So um, that played a part in my decision to just really begin a visual journey. And I put it down for a little bit, and then I didn't pick photography back up until college. And I pursued a minor in photography, which eventually became like my major focus in my life's blood. Um, my first professional gigs were in the early 90s, 1991, working for a small community newspaper in D.C., and then moving to New York in 94, um, connecting with the Associated Press, kind of uh, dabbling in that world in and out while I did music photography and documentary photography in New York. Uh, 2003 saw me um, connecting with a company called Wire Image, which was founded by a childhood friend. Um, and Wire Image was subsequently bought by Getty Images and from, let's say 2006 up until 2012, I was a staffer with, uh, with Getty Images and I'm currently a contractor. I had been based in, um, in addition to being based in Addis Ababa, I was based in Zimbabwe for a little stretch, was based in Johannesburg for a little stretch. I was in New York for 24 years, and I've kind of, you know, my latter years made Africa like my focus because, you know, it's been home. And I always wanted clarity about how Africa was represented. Um, in contrast to the way that the mainstream media usually portrays Africa, which is children covered in flies, bloated bellies, and war and conflict. So I had seen, I'd grown, grown up, you know, in the latter years and spent a lot of time looking at a different Africa. And I just, I always wanted that to be represented. I wanted that to be seen. I think it shows in your, I think it shows in your work, uh, a lot of what you do, especially the report the reporting that you've done in Ethiopia, uh, the details uh, are counter what the mainstream or the Western media was trying to portray Ethiopia and Eritrea to be. And uh, so locally, initially, you are from the Washington, D.C., Virginia area. And, yeah. And how did you get interested on, in Ethiopia specifically? Did you by accident happened to be there when the war was going on or what happened? How did you get involved in it? Okay, yeah, so I began writing a book on Christianity, um, actually completing a photo book 
on Christianity from an Eastern perspective because uh, people respond more strongly to, in my opinion, to the visual coupled with, you know, solid captions and information. So I wanted to do a photo book to talk about the orthodoxies and the Hebraic Christian churches that came into existence after the first century uh, AD. So I made Ethiopia a home base from which I could cover parts of uh, Africa and the uh, Far East and Asia um, in telling this and trying to complete this work. And that was a part of like my, mar my larger mission for Africa because I always believed that the African story needed to be told accurately and was not being told uh, sincerely with respect and compassion. It was always being told in a rather sensational sense and a sense that basically helped people get awards and recognition off of uh, glorifying hardship and chaos and trauma and death. So I wanted to deal with it from a personal perspective uh, with respect to my my elders, my in-laws, my family members, um, and just the continent in general. I, I wanted to really talk about Africa, really talk about it, so. How do you think you've uh, achieved that? Um, I, I have not even scratched the surface. Like I said, I've lived in three countries, um, Ethiopia for years at a time, and South Africa and Zimbabwe for shorter stretches, and I could, I could have stayed in Zimbabwe for a longer period of time, just exploring the culture and the history, and looking at the role that uh, colonization played in the shaping of the country, how the people took the country back, so to speak, um, and just looking at Zim from uh, the perspective of somebody who deeply respected the country and loved the country. Um, but yeah, I mean. Namibia, Angola, um, the Congo, uh, places where, you know, liberation heroes and Pan-African heroes hailed from, um, I have yet to touch. I've only just made it to Ghana last year, and that was for a work trip. Um, but even from just being in Ghana for like five days, I realized I needed to be in Ghana probably for several weeks to a couple of months if not longer, because there's so much richness there in West Africa. So you basically I mean, are going to be positioned in Africa from this point on, is what it sounds like. That's the dream. That's the dream, because um, as people are trying to really understand the continent, um, I'm, I'm here for that. I'm, I'm really desiring to just help people really see Africa for what it is. So, so. while you were doing that, how did you get involved with the uh, situation that was developing or developed in Ethiopia uh, the time that you were there or before? How did that come about? Well, I, I based myself in Ethiopia for the sake of uh, my research on Christianity. Um, I made friends, made inroads with um, historians and people who were uh, very aware of the history of the country. But I also, I, I met the woman who eventually became my wife uh, who herself was a history teacher and historian. And um, it took a few years for us to really kind of get together, but we were great friends and she was a great resource and actually was a great teacher and still is, still is in regards to the entire Horn of Africa and Ethiopian history and church history. Um, but yeah, I lived in Ethiopia more or less from 2014 to 2019 when I left and I, I brought my family with me. And so um, part of the things that, one of the things that happened was I covered the crash of ET-302 and um, really that I think was the beginning of like watching how Western entities craft stories um, and just kind of throw Africans under the bus. I mean, we all remember how these sensational stories came out about the pilot being inexperienced and Ethiopian Airlines being a poor airlines and all of these things which weren't true um, just for the sake of Boeing saving its reputation. And then flash forward to those hearings that um, I attended the last couple and actually documented those, those hearings um, where Boeing full on is forced to admit 
that it designed a, f a faulty aircraft and a faulty navigation system and basically caused the death of uh, almost 500 people between two flights. And but, but just watching all of that transpire, I was like, wow, you know, if, if I hadn't been there and actually had a foot in both worlds, West and East, I might have fell for it. I might have fell for the propaganda. And I carried that with me. So when this war started um, and the way that I heard things, I tapped into my Ethiopian sources and then I tapped into my, um, you know, my, my Western sources and compared notes and I realized like it's it's the same okie doke. You know, there are people in the West today who still don't acknowledge my cadre or the Northern Command attacks. They use the same old adage, oh well, you know, Abi went in to conduct the law and order operation, which basically diminishes and devalues the over sixteen hundred people lost in my cadre and the over three hundred lost in Humera. Um, it diminishes uh, the sacrifices and the, the murder of several thousand ENDF soldiers. And you know, I think that was the, you know, that my, that whole thing was the straw that broke the camel's back. And so I determined that I had to figure out a way to go back and report on the war on a regular basis. Hello, I'm Jeff Pierce, and this is Ethiopia. This is my cadre, to be exact. And in this community, at least 1,564 people were slaughtered. 81 people survived. The number of the casualties is still increasing. I think it's uh, really interesting. You were uh, in Ethiopia from uh, 2014 and on, and you were uh, a witness to transition that was taking place in Ethiopia at that time. Uh, the mm -hmm. All of the TPLF was taking place, and he saw that transition. And you also uh, saw the rise of Abiy Ahmed Ali, and um, the, you saw that transition, and you also saw the, the war. Uh, so you were right there. You were not stranger. Uh, so that's the reason why you were countering uh, the Western propaganda. Is that how you would characterize it? Yes. I mean, um, I mean, glaring little things to big things. And I mean, you, you, we also have to look at the state of journalism now. And how much racism and um, bias still plays a part in how people report on Africa. Uh, how really, I mean, I'll, I'll give you little teeny examples. I mean, there were multiple issues with foreign journalists who might have been expelled from Ethiopia uh, over the course of the war or the past couple years. And then going back to Ethiopia, you hear about the reasons why people were expelled, right? So it's like, for instance, if, if I were to come and meet um, uh, President Isaiah, uh, you know, or attend a press conference at, you know, you know, the, the official government headquarters, I'm not going to come and show up in shorts and flip flops, right? There were individuals who were covering news in Ethiopia who showed up in shorts and flip flops, wow. had no, no regard for the palace, for the official structure for anything that was put in place. Um, and it, it, it blew me away. And I'm just like, well, no wonder so-and-so gets kicked up. No wonder so-and-so is asked to leave. It's like, I cannot get into the White House right now effectively without slacks, a tie, and shirt, right? It's just deemed completely irrespectable or disrespectful. And it, it, it's just not realistic. It's not the kind of respect, whether I agree with whatever president is holding office, whether I agree with their politics or not, you approach the job and you approach this system, that system with respect. And that, that wasn't happening in Ethiopia. You, you respect the office of the presidency, you respect the country, you respect everything else. But I think they do it by design because one of their strategies is always to put uh, the darkest light Mm -hmm. African nations, uh, mm -hmm. part of their demonization, 
process, uh, the humiliation process is they do that everywhere they go, the way they report it, you know, it's a cut and paste and all that. And I think you point out uh, really well with your pictures, with your articles, uh, and, uh, you know, just very, very deep analysis of the things that you do. Uh, you got into it uh, deeply. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Mycadra situation and things like that that you raised earlier? Mm, my cadre is um, it, it's still a situation that uh, uh, deeply affects me, uh, deeply concerns me because, um, you know, we, we basically, and I'll say we, because I include um, people like Sheba Takesta and uh, Jeff Pierce and other people who spent more than two minutes in my cadre in Humera, um, were basically able to prove that, you know, this was a genocidal act that was a part of the coup. So it's like, you may hear people say, okay, they enacted a coup to regain power, but they enacted a coup to basically exterminate large portions of an ethnic group, uh, demonize people from another country, which is Eritrea, and um, resume power. So this involved them, you know, basically taking the lives of almost an entire kebeli of uh, ethnic Amhara in my cadre, um, doing equal amount of damage to the, uh, some of the business and financial leaders in Humera. And they tried to sweep it under the rug. Basically, um, they did not expect survivors from my cadre. They expected that when they achieved the results of the coup and they were back in power, that nobody was gonna talk about it. The same way with Walkites. You know, we're finding out about Walkite right now we're exhuming bodies, we're finding mass graves of 30, 40, 50 people at a time uh, that were buried during the 80s. They assumed they could do the same thing with um, that part of Walkite, with uh, my cadre Humera. Um, they really, really, really expected to just do it and just get back to business as usual. They didn't count on survivors. And I had a chance to speak to those survivors and interview them as did other journalists, Jeff Pierce and Shiba Takesta and a few other people. And it, it, it kind of made the difference, I think. It made the difference. And it kind of, we, we get back on the road to justice to achieve justice for people who lost their husbands and fathers and brothers and what have you over the course of several days of slaughter. It wasn't just one day. It was multiple days because the Samri would go kill, retreat, drink, eat, and go back and kill. They repeated this over the course of several days. Um, the deep sins of the West are those journalists who, you know, being part of the uh, TPLF network, whether inadvertently or intentionally, just went straight to Sudan to interview what they thought were refugees, but they were actually the Samri, uh, with cleverly concocted stories and tales to, to thrill the Western journalists or Western ears about just how bad things were and how bad Tigrayans were getting it. But um, yeah, I mean, to, to actually know the truth and to see it and now to see some of these same Samri youth, you know, emigrating out through Sudan, emigrating to Europe. You know, I mean, we're, we're trying to actually track down that information, but we're hearing from credible sources in Sudan that some of these people are escaping Sudan as refugees and being placed outside of the continent. So they get away with mass murder and they get on to start a new life as quote unquote refugees. Of course, there is a book that came out by a Kenyan who used to work at the uh, United Nations uh, World Food Organization. And he's exposing a great deal of uh, what you're talking about. And uh, you know, they did it to change the narrative, they, uh, to change the attention away from the reality, from the crimes that the TPL have committed and uh, they they wanted to make sure that this the stories about are about other things other than that. so we are very very grateful to the work that you did i am very grateful for the work you know i followed everything that you did uh instagram pictures with a lot of stories to the families and you know the some of the things that, that strike me the most were the images of the people that you captured can you talk a little bit about that? You put a lot of faces on there. How did that impact you as a person and what were you picking? Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? 
I, I feel like um, with the past several conflicts that the world has seen, there's never been a connection with the actual victims um, of these conflicts. So my whole focus was I, I wanted to give voice to people who are often ignored. And um, that's why I kind of did mo more kind of portrait style coverage in addition to a kind of uh, a, a, a general approach to looking at people's environments and circumstances because I kind of feel like, you know, Africans have a hard enough time being seen as individuals and as human. So I, I wanted to really kind of force people to look at like, this woman lost her husband in front of her with her child on her back. He was hacked to death. Mere inches from her face and inches from her child's face. And she is deeply traumatized. She doesn't have access to facilities to go and be treated for PTSD or for her trauma. And she just has to make it. And the TPLF is actually still in the area. So she has to contend with that as well. So uh, I chose to really put faces out there because I wanted people to connect with people. I wanted people to connect with the victims and understand that this is the actual cost of war. For Westerners, I wanted them to understand this is the cost of poor journalism, of um, lack of judgment, and really being ignorant about the situation on the ground. You know, we sit in our comfortable bastions of luxury in the West, and we, you know, choose to engage with stories with the click of a button. Tune it in or turn it off, you know, depending on how the mood strikes us. And we, we basically, we silence people with our ignorance. We make a choice, a conscious choice to silence people. So I, that's why I focused on faces. How did that impact you personally? Um, it, it's traumatizing because uh, and when somebody lets you in and they really let you in, you, begin, you empathize with them and you feel their energy. You pick up on their energy. So in situations where people have lost their entire families and they're just looking at you telling their stories out of a sense of justice or wanting to get justice for their families, they're entrusting you with their truth. And that is heavy. That's very heavy. Those women who spent time talking to me in my cadre and that family in Humera um, basically were ripping the scabs off of wounds to tell me what happened because they wanted to achieve justice for their families that were lost and they wanted to be heard. The same thing with Chenna, the same thing with uh, Chifra, IDPs, the same thing with anybody who's lost anything in this conflict who lets me in to hear their stories. They're entrusting you with their situation and you have to respect that, you have to cherish it, you have to honor that. And that can be a heavy burden. But, you know, graphic details of death, especially as a father, um, was, was pretty, pretty riveting. It's incredibly riveting. You got access to uh in some of the remote places in Ethiopia and Afar and it's really amazing looking at some of the images that you uh, sent out uh, that people gave you that much access especially in a conservative society like that and uh, you know you made that happen I don't know how you made that happen but that's incredible uh, a lot of people who are listening to this um, definitely go to the uh, Instagram images uh, follow uh, Mr. Countess, uh, his account, uh, they, they, these are riveting pictures. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, well, I choose, you know, we, we often have this debate, my colleagues and I, uh, about the fine line between activism and journalism. Um, but I believe that as a journalist, you have to tell the truth. You don't just go from one story to the next. It's like, you know, you open a book, you read a few chapters or you start writing a few chapters and you put it down when it's convenient. That's not, that's not the way you function uh, as a, a, a respectable human being, in my opinion. Uh, my faith has a lot to do with it as well. I feel like I'm duty bound to 
continue to seek justice for people who have been wronged, you know, until they achieve and, and receive justice. So I use Instagram because it allows me to tell stories, more complete stories in great detail. And it, you can reach an audience that normally you may not reach. And pictures are effective. Pictures say a lot. They say a lot more sometimes than what I can say in like, you know, 2000 characters in captions. So um, yeah, Instagram is a primary source or primary tool of uh, spreading awareness about, you know, the way this conflict shaped up. That is um, incredible. Uh, can you, uh, did you get a chance to visit Lala Bella when it was uh, under occupation or after occupation of the TPLF and how that impacted the religious studies that you were after? Uh, how did that impact you? Uh, excuse me, sorry. Um, so yeah, we uh, got to Lali Bella, Jeff Pierce and I got to Lali Bella a few days after the second occupation ended. And, um, you know, we made a point of talking to several of the IDPs that I had befriended who were, who had escaped to Bahardar, as well as the priest who didn't leave Lali Bella. They didn't leave the churches. Um, it was a uh, very profound, but you know, to be honest with you, it, was, it didn't surprise me. Profound faith lessons. I mean, uh, people, the, devo the devotion and the uh, the sincerity of of our elders and uh, the leaders, the church leaders in Lali Bella is, is something that you know. I guess I take it for granted. I'm used to it. I would expect nothing less. But I think it was um, inspirational for the rest of the world to hear that under the potential penalty of death or uh, risk to life and limb, um, the priesthood stayed behind to protect the churches. And that meant their families as well, for the most part. Uh, some people who had large numbers of children or young pregnant you know, wives, they left eventually or they sent them on. So um, it just, I mean, the Lali Bella story is just multiple stories of, of deep faith and devotion. And um, at the same time, it's, it's pretty tragic because with the TPLF and the soldiers who came as part of the TPLF uh, mission came to Lali Bella, they knew the world was watching them. So they didn't commit atrocities in Lali Bella they committed atrocities outside of Lali Bella. You know, they didn't touch the churches, but they burned down the Kebali records and destroyed the records in the police station and destroyed the police station. They destroyed things that people wouldn't typically look at. But I made it a point of going to those kind of places. Um, Aina, or Aina Iesus, the Eye of Jesus, is a town that's just about 30 kilometers outside of uh, Lali Bella on the road to Sakota, and there they basically committed, at first it was reported as 33 rapes in three days, um, including that of a 12 year old girl. Um, but when I went back to do follow up, um, a newly established office, the Office of Women and Girls had conducted um, research and found that because of the stigma of rape, the number of actual victims wasn't accurately reported to me and reported at large at first, <clears throat> but it was actually somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 women were raped in three days in that little town of Aina Iesus. You can basically start driving, you hit the border, the edge of the town and you're through the town in about eight minutes. But they managed to basically rape and pillage <clears throat> in the course of three days during the first occupation and that's a small town it's not as big as uh if i'm gonna say it correctly nufus melcha which is um a little closer to uh that road to bahadar and gondar where 60 women were reportedly raped but i based upon my experience in um aina iesus it was probably more than that Cemerlang sigap pun, sigap pun, 
ሽሽት ይደረ ነበር እና ከዛስ ነገር ነበር ቦታ ላይ ምንም ነገር የሚበለቅ አላገኘንም We were in a remote area while we were on the way back home after four days. They made us in jungle. One out of the four hung me and four of them raped me. So, um, it was sad. I mean, Lali Bella was very, very, very profound, but at the same time, you looked at what happened around Lali Bella and even leading into the massacre at Chenna. And, um, you 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 still i don't know you i have mixed emotions i can look at that and be inspired but then when i find out that at chenna um on a high holy day um they basically began to kill people during kadasi with the tabat out um with their backs they're facing the church and they come in and you start to machine gun people um who aren't even facing you um and then you go on a killing spree that lasts another day that that says something profound and you know western journalists when i was at chenna and i was going through chenna you know sitting there talking to a priest who had to bury his wife and only child and then i hear westerners talking about tplf tplf this or oh, the tplf are being mislabeled and mistreated um it kind of made you it made me sick to my stomach it made me completely nauseous especially when you come back to the us and you come face to face with lawmakers and people who were cheerleading uh the TPLF's efforts how effective do you think uh your reporting was did it have an impact the, the impact that you uh you think you needed? I think I think it was silenced I think it was minimized and silenced um when you understand how the media world works and how you know people who have subscriptions to um the wire services they have access to these photos and these photos will pop up in the media manager or grid that the, everybody operates with in their particular publication and so editors make a conscious choice to to talk about this and um i chose a different route than some of my colleagues in terms of how i covered the war and i chose to deal with the human condition and the effects of um the war on amhara and afar and you know walking into a uh, desi referral hospital and seeing a big hole where there used to be a 1 million dollar oxygen making machine um and seeing the precision with with it was uh removed and taken back to tigray and then for the tigrayans to say we don't have any medical infrastructure we're suffering and dying because we don't have medicines we don't have this we don't have that but yet it's like every hospital on the A2 from Kambalcha forward up to Kobo has been looted so there's no uh infant care there's no um operating tables there's no um telescopes x-ray machines oxygen making machines the pharmacies have all been raided and you see that basically Tigray has better medical apparatus and facilities then the whole amhara region because they've taken everything back to tigray and then to hear the western media echo oh tigray is suffering because they don't have x y and z um and then you think like well you know every major publication over 2500 of them had access to pictures of desi referral hospital and they did nothing they did nothing they stuck with the the tplf narrative and so it can be uh uh demoralizing but you know you have to keep on and present the truth and present the case i'm pretty sure i mean i can't remember names right now of who really exposed the weapons of mass destruction fraud in iraq but you you have to keep on keep it on until you know the light shines in this corner and it'll be exposed for the whole world to see you never stop the mission you keep going forward you know i applaud you for what you do i applaud you for the for the way you think and the way you are approaching thing and the i applaud you for seeing the unfairness and really for pursuing the truth and this is something that we all need as africans and as human beings need to get behind in order to make sure that this atrocities that are being committed by other africans against other africans by blacks against blacks 
and they are indirectly being supported by the West. Uh, this is not a TPLF narrative. This is the narrative that they want to portray to pursue their bigger geopolitical agendas. And so um, it is, it is uh, I'm glad that you had the opportunity to document this uh, for generations to come. And whether uh, people know it today or not, uh, it's going to be there for a long time. And I'm so glad that you can come to a program like this and explain to everybody, especially uh, for the people in the Horn of Africa, of what has happened. And it's, that's really a, a, an incredible achievement for me. Um, for my, uh, for you. I, I do appreciate that. How did the Eritrea picture come about uh, to, to, to start talking about Eritrea?